All right, let's get to it. Welcome, class, to Classics 160 B1. Meet the Ancients! I, of course, am your professor, Dr. Rob Steffen, and what we are going to do today is take a look at the collapse of the Bronze Age. For, two, for nearly 2,000 years, right, civilization has been flourishing. Structures have been getting larger. Sites have been getting bigger. Art has been getting more sophisticated. Uh, and now we see that in all the regions we look at, it all comes crashing down. So let's go ahead and uh, fire up the projector and turn down the lights and take a look at lecture 4.1, The Bronze Age Collapse. All right, so uh, what we've got on our docket for today, we're gonna start with a few announcements. We are then gonna recap the entire Bronze Age, right? In a way, this lecture is marking a transition from this kind of focus over the first few weeks of the semester on the Bronze Age to something that's gonna to be totally different as we move into the world that we traditionally associate with ancient Greece. And then once we get into the discussion of the collapse itself, we're gonna look at three different questions. So we'll start by looking at what is actually collapsing, right? What is the geographical range that we're talking about? And what are the types of sites that are actually falling apart here? Second, we're gonna take a look at some of the explanations for that collapse. And I've, I know you've heard me mention the sea peoples from time to time, so they'll come up again in this lecture, but then we'll also go a little bit beyond that. And then finally, if we have time at the end, if not, we'll push this to Wednesday, but what we'll do is we'll start looking at what happens after the collapse. So this collapse that we're talking about happens over the course of a relatively short amount of time, something around 100 years. And then for hundreds of years afterwards, we get a very different environment uh, in Egypt and in the Near East and in the Aegean world that we've been talking about. Okay, so let's go ahead and uh, look at a few of the announcements for the day. Go ahead and put your screen into speaker view. You can see me, you can see the slides, you can see the words and the images, you know the deal there. Um, if you have a question, please go ahead and direct that to your TA uh, so they'll get back to you or they'll funnel that question to me. Either way, we're gonna get you a response as quickly um, as we can there. Uh, and then in terms of looking forward, um, the reading response is due this Friday as normal. You guys should be into a good groove on those sorts of things. But I also want you to start thinking about your research proposal as well. We are, that is going to be due, what is it? One, two weeks from this Friday. So you don't need it done or anything like that now, but start thinking about it. What type of project might you like to do? What type of question might you be interested in? What are the facets of the things we've been talking about, right? Politics and architecture and religion uh, and warfare, right? What are the aspects of the ancient world that you're interested in and how might they intersect with other interests that you have, whether they're academic or outside of academia? Okay, so let's start here by recapping the Bronze Age. And actually, before we do that, I'm gonna tackle a couple questions uh, in the, the chat here. Um, if something says dropped in D2L, uh, don't worry about that. That's basically, um, this happens more so with the attendance. What that's doing is you're gonna get the lowest number of attendance things dropped because they're gonna turn into zeros at the end of the semester if you missed a class and you get six freebies, right? Right now, if you've been to every class, your lowest grade is 100, so it says dropped, but that's gonna automatically adjust as it goes along. I think there may be one attached to the, the weekly writing assignments as well. Um, if that's the case, I'm gonna remove that. You do have to do all the weekly writing assignments. Uh, so that will take care of itself. Uh, another question about the honors project, that does, um, that does not replace the final project. So if you're in the honors college and you wanna do the honors project, um, you'll be doing both the final project for the course and the honors project. If you're not in honors and you're like, 
the Delphi virtual reality project sounds really cool and I want to do that, then you can kind of use some portion of that for the final project, right? So if you're in the Honors College and you want Honors Cred, you got to do both. Um, if uh, you're not in the Honors College, but you still want to kind of participate in the Honors thing, then it can kind of serve as a substitute. Will you be discussing working in groups uh, this week for the project? Absolutely, I will. Um, so I'm going to talk more about that on Friday. But a couple things going into it. The max group size is going to be four. The amount of work will scale with the number of people you have in your group. I'll be giving you some concrete logistics in terms of how to turn that in. And what else was I going to say? Oh, in terms of the actual style of project, there's a lot of flexibility there, right? So you don't need to wait till Friday to start thinking of what type of project you might want to do. Go ahead and start that process as soon as you can. Um, but I'll have more concrete details uh, in terms of how to submit and that sort of thing on Friday. Okay, so what I'd like to do to begin here is go back and start by kind of recapping the Bronze Age. So who can shoot me a message in the chat and tell me what, well, actually, before we even get to the Bronze Age, let's, let's start back at the beginning here. Okay, life before the Bronze Age, when do people show up? When we start talking about modern humans, what sort of time frame are we looking at here? I got to count up all these zeros. One, two, three, four, five, one, two, three, four, five, six. Yeah, so modern humans... Okay, modern humans are uh, arising around 200,000 BC, according to biological anthropologists, around 200,000 years ago. All right. Now, according to my story, for most of humanity, up until around 10,000 BC, right, about 190,000 years of human existence, what are people doing? What do we do? For mo what have we done for most of our existence? We've been nomadic. And why are we nomadic? We procreate. Yep, that's good. Right? We would not be around right now if our ancestors weren't doing that. We're following food, right? Yeah, right? We're kind of hunting and gathering, right? We're trying to avoid saber-toothed tigers. We're trying to hunt the woolly mammoths. We're trying to procreate uh, with the neighbors next door. Um, that's what people have been doing for 190,000 years after we move into the kind of world of Homo sapiens, right? But about 10,000 BC, we get the end of the Ice Age. And this is also coinciding with a period that we call the Neolithic Revolution. And what are some of the characteristics of that Neolithic revolution? All right, so we get some specialization when, uh, when jobs come about. We settle down. We start farming. We domesticate animals. That's right. Technology becomes a little bit more uh, sophisticated. But the idea is that these climatic changes lead to increased population an increased population density and the decrease of large food sources, right? The decrease of things like woolly mammoths means that it becomes a little bit more efficient to just invest a little bit of work into the land. And that's the advent of farming. And then maybe you put a little fence around the cattle that you have, right? Uh, something along those lines and we get to animal domestication. So those are the aspects of what we call the Neolithic Revolution. And that becomes a very, very important time for us. However, what we can see here, right, this is a recreation of the site of Chatalhoyuk. The houses that arise, right, once we start to settle down, they're pretty darn similar in terms of kind of their size and components. We don't get a lot of differentiation yet. That all comes about with the Bronze Age. So what are some of the things, first of all, what's our time period? If this is happening, right, the Neolithic Revolution and the end of the, Bron or end of the um, Ice Age, right, starts around 10,000 BC. When does the Bronze Age start? Around 2800 BC? Yeah, 
we'll, we'll round it out. We'll call it a nice even, let's say 3000 BC, all right? Um, again, these are rough dates, uh, but we'll say 3000 BC, about 5,000 years ago, that's when things really start to change. Uh, and we start to see a shift from things that look like this into things that look a little bit more complex. Now, who can tell me one hypothesis for why that's occurring? What is spurring this increase in complexity uh, and specialization and sophistication, that sort of thing? What's causing that? Written language, food surplus, pottery. Yeah, these are all things that kind of go into it. Um, why, why does it occur when it does? What, what is the kind of first sort of thing that happens that starts to spur all the other ones? Okay, so, so uh, job specialization, climate change, right? Climate change kind of starts to bring up uh, about the Neolithic Revolution. When it comes to the Bronze Age, though, one of the things that we want to look at um, are large-scale projects. So it's around 3000 BC that people in Egypt and in Mesopotamia decide, decide to start engaging in large-scale irrigation projects. And remember, the, the kind of reason that's so important is one that it, it does cause food surplus. So somebody mentioned that. And it does lead to specialization later on. But the reason that's so important for us now is that it creates a job of such a scale that we need people to start doing different things, right? So somebody mentioned, mentioned labor specialization as well. That arises out of these large scale projects. Okay, so we're talking about 3000 BC to about 1200 BC for the Bronze Age. And again, I don't need super specific dates for this class but that would be a good set of rough dates for you guys to write down. So get the stone tablet, chisel in 3000 BC, no more Neolithic, now on to Bronze Age. All right, and we looked at these societies, right, in a couple different places. So early on, we saw the, the civilizations of Mesopotamia, and we've got a little uh, image of Sargon the Great back here, right? And then we move down south and west into the Nile River Valley, and we see, who do we see here? Who is this? Anybody remember? The famous bust of... Nefertiti, absolutely, yes. One of the most famous sculptures from ancient Egypt. And then after talking about Egypt, right, we moved north and we moved west, and we saw the Minoans and their love for the bull, of course, on the island of Crete. And then the mighty Mycenaeans and the mask of Agamemnon and the very militaristic culture of mainland Greece. And when we're talking about the, the, the Bronze Age, right, what we're talking about is um, not just settling down and farming, right, that's kind of Neolithic. We're talking about the rise of very complex, stratified societies. Okay, um, so let's go ahead and what I'd like you to do is go ahead and tell me some of the, tell me some of the characteristics of the Bronze Age. What are just some big picture characteristics? Urbanization, that's a big one. Very good, right? People start living in cities. And how do, how do cities differ from like what we get here, right? Why would we maybe not call this a city, but we'd call something like a rook a city? So temples, right, very good. Walls, palaces, yeah, and all those things, right? Uh, somebody put it in the, the chat here. All those things are an example of the differentiation of space. So things are getting bigger, right? But we're also getting different types of things in these sorts of settlements. Very good, very good. Okay, so what else? Uh, other than urbanization, what else do we get? Political hierarchy, that's exactly right. Very, very good. Um, these are the people who arise to take charge of those large scale building projects. So when we talk about things like irrigation or monumental architecture, it's frequently the political elite who do the organization of labor. And then the people down here on the bottom of the socioeconomic period, pyramid who are actually doing the labor itself. And how do the political elite justify 
uh, their ability to rule. It's not often saying like, hey, well, I'm doing this organization and therefore I have a justified place. What's one of the main strategies they use? That's right, religion, right? So they use the, the priesthoods and they use kind of religious legitimacy in order to uh, say that their rule um, is, uh, you know, has been approved by God, or maybe they even are the descendants of gods. Excellent. What are some of the other characteristics that we've got here? So we've got political hierarchy and urbanization and religious priesthoods and hierarchy. Uh, we've got writing. We've got professionalized warfare, right? Warfare really takes a step up in terms of scale with bigger armies and chariots and that sort of thing. We've got stratification. That's kind of a product of all of this, right? So we've got the people up here running religion, coordinating projects. We've got people here fighting in the army and writing texts, artisans, right? And then down at the bottom, the people doing a lot of the actual physical labor. We've got monumental architecture. Can anybody tell me what we're looking at on the left-hand side here? This is the palace of what at where? The palace of Minos, right? The legendary King Minos at the site of Knossos. You got it. You got it. On the island of Crete. Bingo. Very good. Very good. Right? And remember, that's very strange because it doesn't have any defensive walls. But these certainly are defensive walls, these Cyclopean walls. And this is from which site here? That's right, this is the site of Mycenae, the type site for the Mycenaean culture. Um, just one of many different fortresses, but this is kind of the biggest and best preserved here. Um, the, the Cyclopean walls of Mycenae with the, uh, um, the Lion's Gate sculpture above one of the main gates into the city. Very good. Right, we see technological developments and artistic developments and sculptures and bronze tools and the wheel and uh, different types of ceramics and all those things. The bronze is actually gonna become a bigger deal in, later in today's lecture. So we're gonna talk more about what bronze actually is and how problems with it, problems with actually creating it, actually might turn into a, a problem for all these different large city-states later in the class. Okay, and then we talked about writing, right? And we saw how writing, kind of like with farming, right? Writing is one of these things that starts a feedback loop. All of a sudden, you're able to convey knowledge that you don't have to keep inside of your head. And you're able to convey it to future generations, and they can build on that knowledge. And so now, instead of everybody, right? Like, let's say this is everything you gain in your lifetime, and then the next generation starts right back at the bottom. Now, all of a sudden, if you gain that much, right? The next generation just starts right there and they start building again, right? So we can get to bigger and bigger and bigger and better things. We see cuneiform out in Mesopotamia and hieroglyphics in Egypt and linear A on the island of Crete and linear B uh, on the Greek mainland. All right, very, very good. So that, uh, those are some of the characteristics of the Bronze Age once again. They are common to many of the different cultures that we've talked about. And that's a good point uh, to kind of look at the map here and kind of orient ourselves geographically, all right? So we've got the Hittites, they're in blue up here. We've got a series of different empires in Mesopotamia. This is the Tigris right here. This is the Euphrates right here. And we get a series of different empires that are competing with each other and frequently taking over each other in that region. We've got the Egyptians, right? And during the New Kingdom, we see them pushing up north and east into the Levant here. Then we've got uh, the Mycenaeans and Minoans, the Minoans on the island of Crete and the Mycenaeans over on the Greek mainland. So a lot of different cultures getting relatively complex during the later part of the Bronze Age, right? So the 14th century is the 1300s. Things are really thriving here in a lot of different parts of the Mediterranean in the Near East and North Africa. Okay, so sometime starting around 1200 BC, that's a good time to write down in your, uh, like in your notebook or your cuneiform tablet. That's when the chaos starts 
to begin, right? Like the chaos starts around 1200 BC. And what we're looking at here is a map of different migration movements. That's where the arrows are. And then also a map of all the different cities that were destroyed during the 1100s, right? During the 12th century. So we can see a bunch of different ones, Mycenae and Knossos, Paphos over on the island of Cyprus and Ugarit, we'll talk about them. We see Byblos and Kadesh. Uh, well, you guys know Kadesh already, right? Um, Hattusa, we'll see it up there. A bunch of different cities down in Egypt, they get the different mark because they did fight, right? There are major battles during this time, but the cities didn't quite get destroyed. But what we're seeing is over the course of 100 years, this map is some of the largest scale cities in the region at this time. And they are all collapsing and burning. So we see the city of Knossos, right? The city state of Knossos destroyed around 1200 BC. One of the interesting things here is, is slightly before that, um, the Mycenaeans actually take it over. We see a change in the material culture when we excavate between the Minoan stuff, which is a bit lower, and then it changes and you start to see Mycenaean culture. Um, and so it happens that in the end, it probably was not a great idea to not have defensive walls <laughs> because the mil militaristic Mycenaeans did take them over. Um, but then even the Mycenaean version of Knossos gets destroyed around 1200 BC. We get Mycenae itself, right? Uh, and we see a lot of other Mycenaean city-states, Tyrans and Pelos, they all get destroyed right around 1200 BCE. And this is a, I mean, these are serious, serious walls. It takes a um, significant siege to enter a city like this and be able to conquer the people within the city of walls, right? So Mycenae gets destroyed, Tyrans gets destroyed, Pelos gets destroyed, Argos gets destroyed. These are the big Mycenaean city-states all going down right around the same time. We get the Hittite capital, right, at Hattusa. That's sacked right around 1200 BC as well. Remember, we talked with the, about the Hittites. This is a very militaristic group, right? They invented the war chariot. They were the earliest to use iron weapons. And even all the way inside of Anatolia, right? The, the Hittite capital is, we can go back and look at the map here. It's not particularly close to the coast, right? Whoever is attacking Hattusa here is getting fairly far inland to do so. We get the legendary city of Troy, right? From Homer's Iliad. Uh, this was discovered in the late 18th, early 19th century. Uh, and there are lots of different levels to the city. And when you excavate, you can actually see the levels of destruction because there's burning layers in the stuff that you excavate. And so it was destroyed actually twice between 1250 and 1175 BC. And then New Kingdom Egypt, right? Uh, Egypt doesn't get destroyed in the same way that these other ones do. When we look at these others, when we look at Knossos, the city burns. Mycenae, the city burns. Hattusa, the city burns. Troy, the city burns. In Egypt, they have some major battles. And about a century later, it does devolve politically into a time of fragmentation but you don't get the same destruction layers the same way that you do over in, the, um, in those other sorts of sites there. All right, so the, the point of all this, though, is to say that when we're talking about the Bronze Age collapse, we're not just talking about one city. And we're not just talking about one culture. We're talking about a very large geographical region and very sophisticated and diverse cultures, all of which are having problems right around the same time. So the question then is, why is this happening, right? What is causing this collapse in so many different places? Okay, so to answer that question, we want to take a trip back to Egypt. 
And what you're looking at here is you're looking at the temple of Mednit Habu, the temple of Ramses III at Mednit Habu. And this was built in the early part of the 12th century. And if you remember back to our discussion of the new kingdom, one of the things that's happening here is that the pharaohs, remember, they're not building pyramids anymore. Instead, they're building very elaborate temples and they're putting them kind of kind of far away from where their tomb actually is, right? So it doesn't give away the location of the tomb. And this is the temple of Ramses III, right? One of the successors uh, of Ramses II, one of the greatest pharaohs of the, new, uh, of the new kingdom. And in addition to what you see here, this is actually the front of the temple. And you, see, you, can, you can see the king over here smiting somebody down here and one of the gods, Re Herakte. Um, but on the back, if you walked around to the back side of the temple, what you end up seeing is another relief of Ramses fighting a bunch of people in boats. And he calls these the people of the nine bows. So he actually identifies nine different groups of people here that have invaded Egypt during his reign. And so you can see them as prisoners down here, right, over here. And you can see kind of the larger picture over here. Now, we can read through what Ramses actually says about this. So this is an excerpt here. You don't need to be able to read it. You can always see this on YouTube later on, but I'll just kind of read through what Ramses is saying about this. Okay, so he says, the countries, the northerners and their isles were disturbed. They were taken away in the fray one at a time. Not one stood before their hands from Keta to Kode to Carchemish, Arvad, Alicia, they were all wasted. They set up camp in a place in Amur. They desolated his people and his land, like that which is not. They came with fire prepared before them. They came forward to Egypt. Their main support was Pelishet, the Checker, the Shekelesh, the Denyan, and the Weshwesh. These lands were united, and they laid their hands upon the land as far as the circle of the earth. Their hearts were confident, full of their plans. But those who reached my boundary... Their seed is not. Their heart and their soul are finished forever and ever. As for those who had assembled before them on the sea, the full flame was in their front before the river mouths, and the wall of metal upon the shore surrounded them. They were dragged, overturned, and laid low upon the beach, slain and made heaps from stern to bow of their galleys, while all their things were cast upon the water. Thus I turned, the waters, uh, turned back the waters to remember Egypt, and when they mention my name in their land, may it consume them while I sit upon the throne of Herakte, and the serpent diadem is fixed upon my head like Ray. I permit not the countries to see the boundaries of Egypt among them. As for the nine, bow, uh, nine bows, I have taken away their land and their boundaries. They are added to mine. Their chiefs and their people come to me with praise. I carried out the plans of the All Lord. The August, the Divine Father, Lord of the Gods. All right, so this is what Ramses III is saying about the Sea Peoples, right? What he calls the Nine Bows. Um, and uh, if you just read something like this, you know, you can see in the first paragraph up here, what he's doing is establishing that this is like a serious force. When they went into these other lands, this, these groups of people, like, destroyed all these people, right? They destroyed the city of Carchemish and uh, Keta, which is, like, another name for the Hittite capital, and Alicia, which is in Cyprus. They destroyed a lot of places, uh, more. But then they get to Egypt, and Ramses III just tramples over all of them. And if you remember back to your reading about the Battle of Kadesh, one of the takeaway points here is that there's a good chance that he might be exaggerating a little bit, right? What we're looking at is propaganda. Now, we don't see the same destruction levels, right? So we don't think that the Egyptian cities got burned in the same way that some of these other places did. But like I mentioned earlier, one of the things that this does lead to is a... It leads to a fragmentation a weakening of, of Egyptian political power and a fragmentation of that political power within a couple generations. So you might think of this invasion of Egypt as sort of 
the beginning of the end. Okay, so what scholars have done is they've gone back to this Egyptian inscription, and this goes back to kind of the late 19th century when people started looking for explanations for why all these places got destroyed at the same time. And they started trying to match up the Egyptian names for these groups, right? The Peleset and the Checker and the, Se uh, the Shekelesh, the Denian. And they started trying to match them up with kind of known groups of people. And what ends up happening is that um, both in Egyptian and in Greek, right, they'll often try to use words that are, are kind of syllables that sound like the names of the groups that they're calling themselves, okay? And so they've tried to kind of match these up phonetically with groups that we know from, the, from Greek language, right? Even if they're not Greek, uh, Greek groups, we know them from the Greek language. So they see the Denian as the Dana, uh, Danaoi, um, which is a Greek group of people, or the Ekwesh as the Achaeans. And when you read the Iliad, you're going to hear a lot about the Achaeans. Uh, the Peloset, they match up with the Philistines, uh, from Palestine, right? Kind of, you can see the root word in all of those, or the Luca or the Lika and the Lycians from Southern Anatolia. Um, the Shekelesh, that's uh, debated. Some people think it's up in the Black Sea. Other people think it refers to the Sicilians or the Siculi at the time, or the Sheridan and the Sardinians. And so that's what scholars have tried to do. They've tried to match it up and there's kind of reason to think, right, that, that some of this linguistic matching is, is solid, but it's also kind of of the point now where we just don't know for sure. It's a solid hypothesis, but those matches aren't, aren't so set in stone that we can definitively say this is, these are the groups of people that happened. Um, now, this is a little bit difficult to see, and you, you don't need to, to be able to read the, the map exactly here. Um, but what you're looking at is kind of where these groups would come from. So the Denian would be up here in kind of modern day Greece. Uh, the Sheridan in Sardinia, you can see the, the link there. Um, the, uh, the Luca would be from Lycia in southern Turkey over here, and the Peleshet um, from uh, the Philistines or Palestine. So... It's a fairly broad and diverse group of people. Okay, so the Egyptians aren't the only ones that provide evidence that it's a group of people from the sea that are causing all these problems. So one of the things we also have is we have a correspondence between the city of Ugarit, right over here, and the island of Cyprus over here. So it comes from right around the same time and we get very, very similar problems occurring, although this time it's not as optimistic as the Egyptian uh, text that we just read. Okay, so we start um, with the king uh, of Alashia um, discussing the, the, the situation uh, of Ugarit. So he says, my father, behold, the enemy ships came here. My cities were burned and they did evil things in my country. Does not my father know that all my troops and chariots are in the land of Hatti? The land of Hatti are, is the land of the Hittites. So this would have been north and west um, uh, of where Ugarit actually is. And all my ships are in the land of Luca. And again, that would have been uh, far west and southwestern Anatolia. Thus the country is abandoned to itself. May my father know it. The seven ships of my enemy that came here inflicted much damage upon us. And then the, uh, one of the governors of a city-state in Cyprus responds, As for the matter concerning those enemies, it was the people from your country and your own ships who did this. And it was the people from your country who committed these transgressions. I am writing to inform you and to protect you. Be aware that it's your own people. So we can see that there's already like uh, people laying blame in different places. And then the ruler of Carchemish, which is a little bit further inland, he sends troops to assist Ugarit, uh, but he says Ugarit's already been sacked. So he says, when your message arrived, the army was humiliated and the city was sacked. Our food and the threshing floors was burnt and the vineyards were also destroyed. Our city is sacked. May you know it. May you know it. So again, we can see problems uh, coming somewhat from the sea, from some of the other 
uh, correspondence and other letters that are being sent around and, uh, at this time that get recorded in these cuneiform tablets. And then when we look over at Greece, we see another story of migration and invasion. And one of these kind of legendary invasions is known as the Dorian invasion. All right. So when you look at Greek history, um, one of the things that the Greeks think was a really big deal was somewhere shortly after 1200, a group of people coming in from the north and then pushing these other groups out. And so one of the things scholars have suggested is that it's these types of migrations, right, that come from like Central Europe up down into Greece, right, that push the groups that were already in Greece out into the Mediterranean and force them to start looking at other places. But nobody knows if this is real. The texts that we have about this Dorian invasion, this group of people coming from more Central Europe down into Greece, our records for that all come from like hundreds of years later. So we have an account from Herodotus, right? So he's the father of history in ancient Greece. But Herodotus is writing like 500 years or 700 years after this would have taken place. But this is his story, right? He says, in inquiring, he found that the Lacedaemonians, those are the Spartans, and the Athenians had preeminence, the first of Dorian and the other of Ionian race. For these were the most eminent, eminent races in the ancient time, the second being a Pelasgian and the first a Hellenic race. And the one never migrated from its place in any direction. The Pelasgians were just always there. But the other was very exceedingly given to wanderings, right? Those are the Dorians. They were wandering all over. For in the reign of Deculion, this race dwelt in Phthiotis. Phthiotis? Phthiotis, we'll go with that. <laughs> um, and in the time of Doris, the son of Helen, and the land lying below Osa and Olympus, which is called Histiatiotis. And when it was driven from Histiatiotis by the sons of Cadmus, and dwelt in Pindos, and was called Macedonian. And thence it moved afterward, afterwards to Dreopus, and from Dreopus it finally came to the Peloponnesus and began to be called Dorian. So he's giving you the story of all these places that the Dorian groups of people are coming. They eventually wind up in the Peloponnese, which is the big peninsula down in the southwest here, right? So this is Herodotus' account of the Dorian invasion. But just keep in mind, he's writing this thing. He's writing this thing like, you know, half a millennium after it would have occurred. Okay, so let's go ahead and do attendance here. Go ahead and get onto D2L. And uh, what I would like you guys to do is go to quiz six, go to February 1st and input red as the answer here, All right? Red is the answer. And I will try to tackle some of the questions in that time. All right, so one of the questions was, uh, in terms of the slides, can we make these a little bit bigger? You can always get on to, um, uh, which one? get on to, to D2L or YouTube afterwards, and, and you can look at them in high def on a, a larger screen if you want. Um, I will try to, for um, Wednesday or Friday or next week or something, I'll play around with the template a little bit and see if I can make these a little bit bigger. Um, but it's going to be something kind of around, around this size. But I'll try to enlarge it somewhat. Uh, other questions? Let's see here. How were Ramsey's words preserved? Were those written down somewhere by someone else? So, Ramsey's words, when we look back at this, where are we? They're preserved on the temple itself. So when you look at the actual like hieroglyphs up here, right? So here you can see some of it is iconographic, right? Just imagery um, kind of telling the story, but it's interspersed with different hieroglyphics. And so the words of Ramses are actually on the temple itself. That's where we're getting that story in that translation. And the answer for today is red. It is red indeed for today. Okay, so I'll give you 60 more seconds and then we will get to it. The drink of the day is once again, 
Um, uh, lime version of Kirkland sparkling water. Brought to you today from... Mednet Habu. Whenever you want to drink an Egyptian temple, get the lime version of Kirkland sparkling water. Mmm, tastes like Osiris. Have I ever had chocolate milk from the Dutch? I never have. Is it good? We're doing attendance right now. Attendance is red for today. All right, I will try the chocolate milk. Chocolate milk is delicious. Everybody, everybody knows that. Absolutely. <laughs> All right, so here's what I want you guys to think about, right? Let's look back at our, our map here, all right? And think about this story of the Sea Peoples, right? This kind of diverse group of people. And to some extent, it kind of makes sense, right? We see a lot of destruction on the coasts, right? When you look at these, a lot of it's along the coast. But when you start thinking of it a little bit deeper, um, the, there become holes in this story, right? Like one is like, all right, well, how are the Sea Peoples attacking like the Hittite capital in inland Turkey, right? How are the Sea Peoples attacking Carchemish, right? Or like attacking cities out here, or Separ, right? That sort of thing. Why aren't they settling down if that's like the, the deal? Why aren't they like going in and taking over these cities? And why, for cities that have been so powerful, like Mycenae, right, and Ugarit, and Byblos, these are incredibly powerful cities for an incredibly long period of time. Why can't they defeat like, a kind of upstart group of people with a few ships. Surely they should be able to tackle that. Now, when scholars have started thinking about this more recently, over the past couple decades, they've started looking for other explanations. Not saying that the Sea Peoples didn't exist or that they didn't play a role, but rather that there might be other things that contribute to this period of collapse. Now, one of the things that we want to do here is we want to look back, right, at the, the namesake of this whole time period, the Bronze Age. And one of the things is that when you make bronze, right, bronze is made of two different metals. It's an alloy of copper. Copper was huge, especially in Cyprus. Cyprus was loaded with copper. And uh, it was also found at a handful of other kind of places. And then it's also made of tin, right? So about 90% copper, about 10% tin. And tin is not found in a lot of places. There's some over here in Western Spain, some up here in Central Europe, right? There's some over here uh, uh, on north of the Black Sea, um, over in this side of things. But there's not a lot of it. And during the Bronze Age, the way people, different groups and city-states get this is through trade, okay? And so it's not just people from Ugarit going to get their tin up here or something like that. They trade with groups of people to get that. And so one of the things that ends up happening is when you get a little bit of disruption with something like the Sea Peoples, it's not just the physical violence that they're exerting that's causing the problem. It's that when that happens, all of these things, all these lines going in all these different directions, that starts to break down. And what we end up getting is something that might look familiar, right? The words have changed, but the idea is similar. What we're getting is now instead of a positive feedback loop, we get what we call a vicious cycle, right? And this is kind of the opposite of the positive feedback loop, is where something happens, but things just get worse and worse and worse. So what we get is when the sea peoples invade, right? The trade routes get disrupted. And when the trade routes get disrupted, these city-states can't get their tin. And when they can't get their tin, they can't make their bronze tools and weapons. And when they can't make their bronze tools and weapons, they become more vulnerable to invasion. And when they become more vulnerable to invasion, the sea peoples are more likely to invade. And that just disrupts things even further. And it goes on and on and on and on like that, right? So we get this, um, it's not just simply 
a physical attack. It's a disruption, a disruption of a much larger network that leads to these problems. And that's not the only thing. When we look at the archeological sites, we don't just see problems arising from people intentionally burning a city, okay? Um, where you can tell that that happens because you find things like arrowheads and, and stuff like that, projectile points, uh, objects of war associated with it. We also see that this 12th century, the 1100s BC, was a time of unprecedented natural disasters. So volcanoes are going off, it has more earthquakes during this century than any time in the preceding 2000 years, especially Greece is hit really, really hard right here, right? So there are natural disasters on top of all this. And then archeologists have also started looking for very, very small things. So you can actually find carbonized pollen in the archeological record. And what you do is you take soil and then you float it in water and this stuff, the, the sand kind of goes to the bottom and the pollen and the, the seeds float to the top. And what we can see here is that over the course of the past couple hundred years, the climate had been changing and it'd been getting a little bit colder and it'd been getting a lot drier and that we're moving into this period of drought. Plants were adapting for almost a desert-like environment. And so this, these kind of small pollen samples are suggestive of a time of kind of increasing drought and famine, even if there aren't any sorts of invasions. But think about what that causes, right? What if all of a sudden, right, you're the guy down on the bottom of that socioeconomic pyramid, right? And all of a sudden you don't have food anymore. You're gonna start thinking that, hey, this deal isn't such a good deal anymore, right? And so what ends up happening, we get another feedback loop here, right? This one, act. It, the feedback loop actually here doesn't work that well, but you can see the series of connections even if it doesn't funnel back in the kind of loop form that we've seen so far. But we see the climate worsening, leading to drought and famine, right? That leads people to rebel. That also, right, explains why people are moving. That was one of the big questions people had. Why at this time do we get all these people launching out from Sardinia in Sicily in Southern Anatolia? Why are they all launching out on their boats to go start pillaging in the first place? Well, famine would be a good reason, right? Why people would be leaving one place in search of another. You throw in some massive earthquakes and you get the collapse of a lot of city-states. All right? So the kind of takeaway point here is that uh, we're not discounting the role of the, the sea peoples and the, the destruction of these Bronze Age city-states. Uh, in cultures around 1200 BC. Uh, but rather, we want to think of this in, in terms of a much larger system that's all in interconnected, right? So something like invasion would be one part of a much larger story. Something that includes earthquakes and droughts and migrations and invasions and rebellions and then economic networks breaking down along the way. And if you want to read more of this, right, if you're, you're listening to this kind of stuff and you're like, this is really, really cool and I would read about it for fun, check out Eric Klein's book called 1177 BC, The Year Civilization Collapsed. And it's a semi-academic book. So he's a professor of archaeology. Um, but this is also marketed towards a broader audience. So it brings in modern archaeological work, but does so in a, a fairly engaging way. And it does a great job of explaining how it's all those systems coming together to cause collapse. All right, so what we're gonna do next time is we will be talking about what happens after the collapse. We call that the Dark Ages. We'll talk about what makes the Dark Ages dark. And concluding thoughts for today, right? Um, the Bronze Age was a time of lots of differentiation. And what we're gonna see on Wednesday is that we lose all of that differentiation. So in the meantime, start getting ready for Friday's reading response. Uh, start reading an excerpt of Homer's Iliad. You'll see that he harkens back to the Bronze Age, but also to the Dark Ages that we're gonna see uh, on Wednesday. Other than that, uh, that is it for today. We will go ahead and turn the lights back on here. Uh, thank you guys for joining me. Have a wonderful couple of days, and I will see you all on Wednesday. All right, bye everyone. <laughs>